Did you see the numbers coming out of Queen's Park the other day? The books of the province of Ontario have gone from a rather massive deficit to a rather modest surplus. No one predicted it, but the fact that it happened now leads to all sorts of unexpected permutations for our next guest. Peter bethlen Falvey is Ontario's Minister of Finance and the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge, and he joins us now, I'm happy to say, in the studio, as opposed to on a Skype feed or something like that. It's good to see you in person. It's great to see you again, Steve. Thank you for being here. We're going to start by just sharing. You want to call for these, or should I? Put it on the tape, Sheldon. There we go. Okay, Sheldon, if you would, here's what happened to the province's ledger sheet over the past year. The original deficit from the March 2021 budget was anticipated at $33.1 billion. And then only a couple of months ago, the estimate was $13.5 billion, but the actual result turned into a $2.1 billion surplus. Now that is, I think it's fair to say, a rather unprecedented turnaround, and I wonder if you saw it coming. Well, we updated the numbers as we went uh, along, but you know, you think about when you put the budget together in February of 2021, what's the environment? Well, Delta was hitting us pretty hard. Pretty gloomy uh, environment for uh, the economy, for dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and then as we went through the year, we updated those numbers, and you just highlighted by August of uh, uh, this year, we updated it again. Uh, and, and what really what, uh, what occurred there was uh, we got out of COVID, uh, thankfully, and here we are in person again. Uh, but it also highlighted that the inflation was higher than any economist had expected. The economy rebounded more than anyone expected. So... Um, I think every, every jurisdiction around the world felt that, and we were not immune from that. When the Ministry of Finance officials came to you and briefed you on the numbers, did you say to them, go back and take a second look at it, this can't be true? No, but you want to make sure you understand the drivers of those, uh, those numbers, and uh, a big part of it is the revenue side. And, and of course, uh, with the economy, as I just said, growing faster than any economist, we get private sector forecasts out there. Uh, Inflation higher than than most had expected. How much of this is that? It's a big. It's it's a, the a lion's share. It? It's a lion's share. Mm -hmm. And I would say this uh, as well, Steve. You know, you look across the country. You know, Ontario wasn't the only one. In fact, our difference was much smaller than any other province. Um, you know, you look at uh, Alberta that uh, had a much bigger delta, uh, mm -hmm. primarily because of the price of oil. But every province, BC, Quebec, and the feds are going to come out with their numbers. It'll be the same story. It's also important to point out that that was for the year ended March 31st. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really a look back in time. It's rear view mirror, but still it's, it's, I mean, it's a hell of a turnaround. And, you know, I think one of the things we want to do here is sort of explain to, to people watching and listening uh, how this happened. Obviously you've got revenues that are up in terms of sales taxes people paid and income taxes that people paid and companies paid more corporate taxes. So all those things went up and there's inflation that you talked about and I guess federal transfers. That would be part of the picture as well. As you look at all of those different things, can you sort of help us understand what's most responsible for all of what just transpired? It's a great question. The simple way I look at it is just the size of the economy. And so if, the, if you look at the forecast back in March of 2021 versus where we ended up, big difference, big change. The other thing is the number of people working. You know, if we're locked down, people aren't working, they're not getting raises. Uh, so that's a big factor. And the other factor that you don't really you don't really find out in, in pieces is how many people are selling stocks or dividends or selling you know, investments, real estate investments, and that's collected by the federal government and then remitted to us. But uh, you know, we, we look at the overall economy as, as the benchmark, and, and that's why we're a little bit concerned now in the sense that the economy uh, is uh, lower than the economists uh, forecasted. Hmm. So that's what we're dealing with right now. I don't mean this next question to sound as dripping with uh, sarcasm as you probably think it will sound, but... Um, you're, you're not an unbiased observer to these things either. How much of what's transpired happened because of what you would call your wise stewardship of the economy? And how much of it was you just happened to be the right guy at the right place at the right time while the economy was booming back? No, I didn't detect any sarcasm in, in that uh, question <laughs> yeah. at all. I, I think, you know, what's important in all of this is that uh, no one has a perfect crystal ball. What is really important, I think, and coming from the private sector, if you're a CEO of a company and you've got shareholders, you go out every quarter and you tell them how the results are and what you think is going to come around the corner. So every 90 days I'm out there, good, bad or ugly, telling the people of Ontario, this is how we're spending your money, this is where we're going. And uh, that's why it's also important to really have a plan. 
you know, my budget, which was uh, the basic, turned out to be the campaign platform, was kind of a transparent plan. This is how we plan to go forward and we'll update you every 90 days on how we're doing. Well, let me do what you just suggested, which is see if we can peek around that corner a little bit. And you tell us whether, was this really a one-shot deal or is this a sign of things to come? Well, as I said, uh, the, uh, the private forecasters that we rely on um, are now downgrading their forecasts. You know, obviously the accumulation of higher interest rates, global uh, geopolitical risks, uh, other factors are, are having an impact on the economy. Um, and we still are projecting, you know, when I went out in August for the first quarter results, an $18.8 billion deficit for this year. Hmm. Uh, and so these are, uh, these are this is an environment right now where we have a lot of uncertainty. You know, the economic environment is uncertain. Uh, a lot of people are hurting in this environment. Uh, you know, the price of a lot of things is, is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of our job to continue to monitor that. And so we're, we're, we'll, I'll be out uh, for the fall economic statement on or before November 15th to update the people of Ontario again how we're spending their money and how our plan is, is working. I'm going to ask you more about that economic statement in a few minutes, but I, I just want to uh, circle back on some of this stuff that we're talking about as it relates to last year. Did I read this right? Was growth in the province of Ontario at 12% year over year last year? Well, that's with in including inflation. You know, most of the GDP you look at is real GDP, which mm -hmm. means you take out inflation and, you know, Bank of Canada targets 2% inflation, so plus or minus. So real GDP, uh, typically 2 to 4%. No. Uh, we're in an environment where the inflation, we haven't seen that, Steve. You haven't seen that since you were a young college Absolutely. student. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, yeah. Um, me too, by the way. So <laughs> we're in that same boat. Uh, we haven't seen interest rates or inflation uh, at this level, so that has an impact on the non what we call the nominal GDP and the size of the economy. But obviously, inflation is coming down, but still very high. Interest rates are going up, and that hurts a lot of people in business. But presumably, we're going back to the more typical one, two, three percent growth rates that we've seen basically for the last twenty-five years. Well, uh, before, uh, once you take out inflation, you know, we, we, we are targeting growth. Um, and, you know, we have, I th you know, think, like to think we have a great uh, plan to build this economy. And that's a lot of our, was our focus in the campaign. A lot of infrastructure investments. I just came from uh, Pickering this morning, uh, where we, uh, went along with the Premier, did the uh, grand opening of the Kubota 560,000 square foot facility, 250 new jobs. You know, this is the type of thing that uh, I think the people of Ontario want. You ever driven one of those things? I've sat in one. You sat in one for the photo op this morning. Have you? I haven't driven one, but I've seen them. They're big. Yeah, and you're yeah. seeing them. You know, construction and farming mm -hmm. equipment. Uh, you're seeing that right mm -hmm. across the province. Let's do a little budgeting 101 here for our viewers. When when you, as the treasurer of the province, run a deficit, it means you basically got to go up the markets. You got to borrow money in order to pay for the shortfall of what you've committed to spend. Um, you had a surplus last year, apparently, which means. You found $2.1 billion extra in your pocket you didn't anticipate having. Where does that $2.1 billion go? Well, in that case, we put it against the accumulated debt. You just paid down debt. You, you know, we, we, we meet, and, it, and the lower deficit also means, in that case, the surplus, we can pay down debt. But lower deficits means that we don't have to borrow as much. When we don't borrow as much, we're not paying as much for interest, so we can spend it on other things. Do you have the final decision as finance minister to make that call? In other words, to pay down debt as opposed to take that money and spend it on other things. I make recommendations to our cabinet, to our premier, and, and uh, those recommendations are either accepted or not. And uh, they, let's just say the finance minister has a lot of say in, in the direction that you go. That was the recommendation you made, and yes. presumably the premier yeah. took your recommendation. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, before uh, the pandemic, where we spared no expense in fighting uh, COVID, and by the way, I still have in this year's budget money set aside for battling COVID, um, the remnants of it, testing, tutoring, support, you know, that sort of thing, for kids to catch up. But, you know, you do have, uh, you do have a say, and in, in we were uh, the most indebted sovereign, you know, in the world before. Sub-sovereign Sub-sovereign, I should yep. say, sub-sovereign yep. before. Uh, we have accumulated a lot of debt since 1867, mm -hmm. since Confederation. So... You know, we make choices about the investments that we're making and what we do if we have a surplus. Needless to say, there were others who thought that they had better ideas for that surplus than paying down debt. They see needs out there, and their advice to you would have been, don't put that money towards debts accumulated already. You probably should have spent it on something else. Healthcare, education, the environment, the justice system, whatever. 
Why did you not do that? We did do that. With that $2.1 billion? If you look at the investments uh, that we made in, in that, that fiscal year, historic investments in uh, health care. We increased the health care bu budget by uh, a significant amount. We're well, doing it again You're up this to year. $75 billion now in health care. Yeah, I know. and if you looked yeah. at it... Uh, you know, if you look back four years ago, uh, what, when we came into power, you know, what, what the expenditures were. So significant investments. Why are we making significant investments in, in education, in health care, in social services, in infrastructure? Uh, because that's the right thing to do when you have an aging population in health care, when COVID exposes some of the lack of investments over, over the last decade or two. Uh, if you look at my riding of Pickering Uxbridge going back, you know, the Ajax Pickering Hospital uh, is right now beside a new facility, the Ajax Pickering Long-Term Care Facility. There were zero beds built in Ajax or Pickering for seven years up to 2018. Zero. You mean zero or zero net zero beds? Zero net new beds in. Zero net new. new. So some were built, but others were closed down. Yeah, so no, no, and, and but the aging population is mm -hmm. just mad. Mm -hmm. um, it's increasing rapidly, you know. You and I are, are, are heading towards speak that. Speak for yourself. Okay, I'll yeah, just speak yeah. for, I'm aging. And not Steve. <laughs> he's, he's staying the same. So uh, my point being that uh, we have to make a lot of investments, not just in physical infrastructure, hospitals, highways, public transit, long-term care facilities. We need the people uh, to be able to uh, staff those facilities. Long-term care needs personal support workers, nurses. So these investments you'll see in, in what we did in 2021 and what we're doing again this fiscal year, um, historic and unprecedented investments to build for today and for tomorrow. I wonder if there wasn't a part of you, though, that when you found out that you did run a surplus last year, said, hmm, normally this would be good news, but I'm not sure this is actually good news right now because I've been telling people for a long time that the cupboard is bare and we've got these public sector negotiations with the teacher unions and with the educational assistants and so on, and I've been telling them for the longest time there's no money, and actually we ran a surplus last year. Does it make it harder to bargain with the public sector workers when you have this kind of buoyant fiscal news? Well, again, that was a point in time last year, or it, it, that ended, you know, mm -hmm. in March of 2021, but uh, uh, go, uh, March of 2022, but it goes back to the start in but March But it conveys of an impression that there's more money there than, and if you, than, you, and, than you thought. And you look at the investments that we're making, and you look mm -hmm. again at what we're doing this year, historic investments in education, historic investments in healthcare, historic investments in long-term care, we're making those investments. Uh, of course, I can't speak specifically about the negotiations with the teachers, but we said we'll, we're fair and reasonable and negotiating in good faith, and that's exactly what we're doing. The Premier also said the other day, don't test me. Yeah, no, well, listen, uh, we have to continue, um, and I, I... Don't force my hand, I think, is what he said. Don't force yeah, my hand. Yeah, look, look, uh, we, uh, we're at the table right now, um, and we'll continue to be at the table in good faith. But look at some of the other things that we've done. We've uh, invested in building new schools. Two new ones, I'll go back to Pickering, in, in North Pickering, first time in years. Uh, we, we are making investments in tutoring support for kids to catch up. You know, the minister and uh, the premier have been very clear, Steve, you know, we need our kids in school. We can't, you know, we, we, we want them to... No, I, I get all this, and this is, and I, I'm, you know, I understand why you want to trumpet your accomplishments here, and that's fine, but again, this is all about conveying to the public service or to teachers, you know, we either do have money or we don't have money. Now, when you were running a $33 billion deficit, I think everybody got the understanding that, you know, this is not the year to ask for 5 or 10% increase. But when you got a $2 billion surplus, can you be surprised that some of the unions out there are asking for significant increases? You know, that surplus, again, was a point in time in the past, you, you know, six months ago in the current fiscal year, uh, we're projecting an $18.8 .8 billion deficit. I'll have an update uh, by the fall economic statement by November 15th. But we have to be responsible at the same time as being uh, fair and reasonable, and we're going to continue to do that. Does fair and reasonable include offering people 1% when inflation's at 7? You know, uh, the 1%, we, we put that in Bill 124. Yep. That was uh, three years ago. And, you know, take the teachers, for example. They've already gone through that three-year period at 1%. What we're talking about here is higher than 1%, and that's what we have on the table. One and a quarter percent is what you've publicly said for some teachers. Yeah, and uh, we've uh, we've uh, also, uh, for the education workers, a 2% for people making under 40000 40, and we're still at the table. So I, I don't want to talk further about that because 
They're at the table with the minister. They're at the table, but the, your colleague, the minister of education, and your boss, the premier, have both basically, in not so many words, said, if we don't get a deal with you guys, we're going to legislate you back to work. Would you agree with that? Look, what I'm, I'm going to agree with is that uh, the kids need to stay in school. Like, I've talked to a lot of parents. Um, you know, this is very important. We're making uh, historic investments in supporting our schools by increasing the funding for each student, by putting in mental health supports, by putting in tutoring supports, by, by building more schools, by, um, you know, hiring more people. So, you know, this is something we all have to come together and do it. what's fair for the the students, the parents, the teachers, but also is fair for the taxpayer. I know, because you've said it twice already, that you plan to bring out this fall economic statement within about a month, a little over a month, within that uh, window. Can you give us a hint about what might be in it today? Well, I think, um, you know, what's, what's important is that I'm out again, not only with the fall economic statement giving an update on the finances, but the second quarter results as well. And I, I really think it's important to be transparent and to be out there uh, with, with that. You know, you're asking for what might be in the uh, fall economic statement, so you're not going to fall off your chair when I say I'm not going to disclose that. But you could give, me, break, a, uh, breaking give news. me a little hint about something. I mean, you've already said that the deficit is going to be much more significant than, you know, it's not going to be a $2 billion surplus this year. You've said that. Well, what I'm saying is, you know, we, we were pretty transparent with the budget um, that we tabled in April. We went to uh, the people. They endorsed that budget, I think, roundly, the second biggest majority since... Uh, <laughs> If you go back in time, folks, I just uh, had a chat with Steve about Howard Ferguson in uh, 1926, got a bigger majority the second time. Uh, so we've got support for that budget. We were called the legislature, the only one in Canada, to pass that budget, but also to, to get back to work for the people of Ontario. So we're just going to continue that work in the fall economic statement and give people an update on the progress that we're making. Is it your advice to Ontarians right now, given how the forthcoming year is looking a lot less buoyant than the previous year turned out to be. Do you think people ought to keep priming this economic pump by spending more, even if it means going into additional debt in order to keep the economy humming? I think, I think you have to you certainly look at uh, what's happened in the UK, you know, where you cut taxes and increase spending and the markets are, you know, reacted the way they did. I Negatively. Think Negatively, I think we, we've uh, had very uh, good success in the global bond markets, in part because we've, got, uh, we've shown a plan, a fiscal plan, how we're going to build Ontario, how we're going to build infrastructure, how we're going to support labour, help keep costs down. So we've been very transparent about that and all doing it with, at the same time while uh, lowering the deficit uh, over time. You know, we said uh, for this year it would be 19.9, uh, 19.8. I reduced it in the first quarter to 18.8. Mm -hmm. We'll have an update again by November 15th. Okay. Uh, we got a minute left here, and I do want to ask you about, I think, what's the most important employer in your riding, and that is the nuclear power generating station in Pickering, which your government has decided to extend again. Um, this is a station that's, uh, well, it's pretty old, and uh, I guess it was built more than 50 years ago. And I guess um, I want to ask you whether you are absolutely certain that this facility can be 100% safe, given that it is past its best before date. Yeah, listen, I, uh, you and I are not nuclear uh, scientists or engineers. Mm -hmm. We'll let the Canadian uh, Nuclear Safety Commission mm -hmm. and the experts opine on that. I think the bottom line is, apart from the great jobs and the great people that work at the, both the Pickering nuclear plant and the Darlington, and we're putting in a small modular reactor into the Darlington facility, is that uh, you know we have we're a victim of our own success somewhat in, in Ontario. We're generating more manufacturing jobs. We're bringing jobs back to Ontario. Electric vehicle production. Those electric vehicles will need to be powered by something. Mm -hmm. We just in Hamilton announced that the uh, the DeFasco plant will now go green with electricity mm -hmm. off of coal, doing the same thing up in Sault Ste. Marie. You know, that's going to require a lot of energy. we got to think down the road a little bit, and nuclear has been proven to be safe, reliable, clean, good jobs. And, uh, and so thinking about 14% of our energy is coming out of that Pickering nuclear station. Mm -hmm. It's the newer ones, not the ones that were built in the 70s, but the, the ones that were built in the 80s. And, you know, we've had a track record of refurbishing uh, plants in Bruce uh, Power at in the Bruce Peninsula, yeah. as well as Darlington, that uh, that's going through right now. So we'll let the experts uh, make sure that it's safe. But I think this is a, this is a good um, policy option for for the people of Ontario to take a hard look at. 
That's Peter Bethlenfaldi, the Minister of Finance for Ontario, MPP, as you may have heard, for Pickering Uxbridge. We thank you for making the trip into TVO tonight. Pleasure to be with you again in person, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.